at how China encourages openness while acknowledging differences as the Communist Party of China marks its centenary. One hundred years of trailblazing, one hundred years of striving, from extreme poverty to a well-off society, from a sleeping giant to a responsible global power. Mission and vision from the past and into the future. Decoding the Communist Party of China. Centenary and beyond, only on CGTN. You're watching Global Watch on CGTN. Now we continue our special series, Centenary and Beyond, to mark 100 years since the founding of the Communist Party of China. We look back over the party's history and mission with our reporters bringing you stories from the past and present. We get insights from experts on what drives the CPC in fulfilling its present mission. Today we look at how the party has stuck to the diplomatic principle of openness and seeking common ground while acknowledging differences from China-US ping-pong diplomacy to friendly cooperation between China and Africa. And for more on that, we cross live to our reporter Tu Huiao in Beijing and Robert Nagila in Nairobi. Actually, Tu Huiao is at the Capital Indoor Stadium which hosted friendly table tennis matches between the Chinese and U.S. teams back in 1971 as part of the ping-pong diplomacy. And Robert Nagila is at Mombasa, Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway Station, which is an example of win-win cooperation between China and Africa. And ping-pong diplomacy was a classic episode in the diplomatic history of China and the United States. The Capitol Indoor Stadium witnessed a historic event which helped to break the ice after more than two decades of estrangement between the two sides. And for more on that, let's talk to our reporter Chu Huiao. He's right now inside the stadium. Hello, Huiao. There's one event in history that shows how the game of ping pong is more than just a sport. It has been 50 years since the historic moment of ping pong diplomacy. And back in 1971, where I'm standing right now has witnessed a historic exchange between the table tennis players of China and America. Athletes from both sides played several friendly matches here at the Capitol Indoor Stadium. As you know, China is known for producing exceptional ping pong players, so the Chinese athletes were vastly superior. But the slogan they used at the time was, friendship first, competition second. Many say it was this event that led to the normalization of ties between China and America in the 1970s and broke the ice after decades of strained China-U.S. relations. Now, my colleague Sun Tianyuan is going to give you a closer look at this historic occasion. It all started with a friendly chat with an American who got on the wrong bus. The year was 1971. The Chinese national ping pong team was attending the World Table Tennis Championship in Japan. They were on a bus to the stadium, laughing and chatting, and all of a sudden, an American hopped on. There was silence at first. Then a Chinese paddler broke the ice. Chinese player Zhuang Zedong started talking to the unexpected guest, whose name was Glenn Cohen, a member of the U.S. team. The next day, it was making headlines everywhere. However, Zhang's teammates were worried about his bold move. At that time, backslapping with an American was seen as illicit. But they asked what he was thinking. Zhang replied, it had nothing to do with politics. It was merely a conversation between Chinese and American athletes. The U.S. team made a request during the tournament, saying they hoped their players could pay a visit to China at a later date. The Chinese leadership hesitated at first, then Chairman Mao Zedong decided to invite them for a friendly tour, the first interaction of its kind since 1949. After that came former U.S. President Richard Nixon's landmark visit 
in February of 1972. Exchanges went back and forth, just like a game of table tennis, and it ultimately helped the two countries to establish diplomatic ties in 1979. Like former Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai said, as small as it is, ping pong has set the world in motion. So to talk more about the significance of ping pong diplomacy, I'm now joined by Mr. Gao Zhikai, our chair professor from Suzhou University. So thank you, Mr. Gao, thank for you. joining us. Now, we know China is a ping pong powerhouse. So probably the American players had no chance of beating the Chinese players at those matches. But it was not about that, right? It was not a real competition. So what was the atmosphere like? Well, indeed, at that time, China's slogan was friendship first and competition second. And I think China's invitation for the American team to come to China and the American team's acceptance of the Chinese invitation and did coming to China and compete in the stadium really opened the door for the eventual uh, normalization of China-U.S. relations. No one knew at that time that secret arrangements were being made for the first secret visit to China by Dr. Henry Kissinger. And we all believed that the American ping pong team's uh, presence in this stadium uh, created the first opportunity for the Chinese people mm. to see them with their own eyes that the Chinese people and the American people actually share many things in common and they both enjoyed the ping pong game. Right, humanizing each other through sports. Why don't we walk up to the stands, look at this beautiful stadium we are in. Uh, so just to put the ping pong diplomacy into its historical context, uh, we know Chairman Mao Zedong made the decision to invite the U.S. ping pong delegation to China. What was he thinking exactly? Because China's U.S. relations were pretty much strained at that time. Absolutely. I think uh, when the Chinese ping pong team and the American team, ping pong team met each other in Japan, it mm -hmm. was purely by accident. But both the Chinese teams and the American team seized the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And when the Chinese team wanted to provide an invitation for the American ping pong players to visit China, mm -hmm. the Chinese government's initial decision was not to issue the invitation. Right, the but foreign ministry. Exactly. And Mao Zedong decided that China should invite the American ping pong players to China. So that showed the wisdom and the courage and the vision of Mao Zedong. Indeed, ping pong has played a vital role in strengthening China-U.S. relations. And generations of Chinese diplomats have made fruitful and significant contributions to the country's international relations. Our reporter Su Yuting talks to Lin Songtian, president of the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, to learn more about how the diplomat has spent his life dedicated to people-to-people -to -people diplomacy. I have engaged in diplomatic service for more than 30 years. I love this uh, uh, service as a diplomat. Uh, I, I get a lot of title from the African friend. They give me a lot of title, but the best one I, I like to have, I feel very proud, is the ambassador of people. Promoting mutual understanding, friendship and trust among the people of China and around the world. I'm Lin Song Tian. I'm very happy to serve as a diplomat of the People's Republic of China and traveling around almost 100 countries in the world and serve as an ambassador, or ambassador to Liberia, Malawi and South Africa, but now serve as a, a president of the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with a Foreign Country, that this is the association for people to peoples. People to people diplomacy has been the key focus of Ling's work. I love this uh, uh, service as a diplomat. Uh, I, I get a lot of title from the African friend. They give me a lot of title, but the best one I, I like to have, I feel very proud, is the ambassador of people. He led the association to mobilize foreign enterprises and local organizations to go to Wuhan and provide support in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. We mobilize a lot of Chinese local government, friendship city, or in the world we call the city, city and association to donate or provide a large amount of the medical supply to many countries at this, as I know, is more than 
70 organizations uh, in 39 countries in the world. Lin stressed that China is a country that has never waged a war of aggression and adheres to peaceful development. We always believe the diplomat is not to fight, but to find a solution to, to see the common ground while reserving the differences. And that is, as a diplomat, that is our job. He adds that the country has become a major engine driving world development, an important force safeguarding world peace. I have engaged in diplomatic service for more than 30 years. As a diplomat, I deeply feel that justice always prevails. 50 years ago, as you know, that China restored its re legitimacy at the United Nations. It's the right choice and serve the fundamental interests of the world. Here, I think, is the guest house for uh, when I received a friend from other countries. I'd like to start it from here that this is the core meaning of President Xi Jinping's thought. Win-win cooperation for common development. Mm. So they are very interested to stand here to take one picture all the way writing in Chinese. Mm. But they are, the, the meaning is there. Mm. And this is the guidance of China's uh, international relations and international corporations. Lin has decorated the guest house with traditional Chinese calligraphy. He says it's a symbol of Chinese vision, adding that the door of the association is always open to welcome friends to visit and learn more about China. Su Yuting, CGTN, Beijing. Talking about people-to-people -people diplomacy, and let's get back to our reporter Tu Hui at Beijing's capital, Indoor Stadium, where a historical event took place there with strong implications uh, for the past and even for the future. Hello, Huya. Hello there, Pandan. Sorry, there were some technical issues. Now, in a couple months from now, since we were talking about sports, China will be hosting the Winter Olympics. And if that event is a success, Beijing will be the first city to have ever hosted both Summer and Winter Olympics. And you know what? This stadium is going to welcome the sports delegation once again, coming from not just the United States, but from around the world. Short track speed skating and figure skating athletes will compete here. So for more, we are joined by our professor Gao Zhikai once again. Uh, Mr. Gao, we know 2022 is a very special year because on one hand, it marks the beginning of a new century for the Communist Party of China. And China is hosting another Olympics at its capital. What messages is China sending? Yes, I think the whole nation in China are preparing for the celebration of the centenary of the CPC, which is a very, very important event. CPC has a total membership of more than 100 million members. It's the largest political force anywhere in the world. And I think it is very important for us to celebrate the centenary and prepare for the next 100 years. And I think the hosting of the Winter Olympic is a major event for China because this will demonstrate once again, China is a stable country with a lot of security and prosperity and the people are very united and we want to open the door to welcome athletes from all the countries for the Winter Olympics and I truly believe Winter Olympics in Beijing will be another great success right. in the Olympic history. Well, we all wish the Winter Olympics a great success ahead and now at the moment China-US relations are facing some serious challenges with some US politicians even calling for boycotting the Beijing Olympics uh, since we are in the stadium. What legacy or historic lessons can we learn from the ping pong diplomacy given that ideological differences are posing challenges again to the bilateral relations? Indeed, between China and the United States, I hope we can have more such ping pong diplomacy or basketball diplomacy or figure skating diplomacy you just now mentioned. The more exchanges between the Chinese people and the American people, the better it will be for our two great nations and for world peace and stability in the world. Talking about boycotting Winter Olympics, why? Because it's very unfair to the athletes and the coaches and their families. They've prepared for years, for their whole life, for this particular moment. Let them have the opportunity to compete and shine and excel and demonstrate to the world that they are the best 
athletes, whether they are from the United States or from Norway, from any other country or from China locally, let's welcome them and give them the decency and the dignity to compete. We've all seen how ping pong diplomacy has changed the landscape between people to people exchanges as well as the relations between the two countries. So there's definitely a spirit to be inherited from that historic occasion. That's all from me. Back to you, Pandan. Thank you very much. Our reporter Tui Huiao in Beijing. An equal dialogue and win-win cooperation are among the basic principles of China-Africa relations. The two sides have established close collaboration and communication while each seeks individual development. The Belt and Road Initiative marks a new chapter in friendship for the two sides as it upgrades relations in so many aspects. And for more on that, let's cross live to our correspondent Robert Nagila in Nairobi. Robert, let's start from where you are right now. Well, absolutely. I'm at the Standard Gauge Railway Station in Nairobi, the ultra-modern Standard Gauge Railway, which was launched in 2017. Now, this runs about 500 kilometers to the coastal city of Mombasa and on the opposite side to the inland depot in Naivasha, about 120 kilometers from here. More on that in a moment. Now, China has been instrumental in Africa's modernization. through uh, It's promoted development through the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, uh, through uh, agriculture, uh, through uh, areas of cooperation like agriculture, infrastructural development, digital development, all tied towards industrialization aimed at connectivity. Now, this is where the Belt and Road Initiative comes in, where you have projects such as the Standard Gauge Railway, at, uh, which is the station where we are at this particular moment, which connects the capital city, Nairobi, to Mombasa. Now, this is, a, this is about 500 kilometers connecting the two cities, but it's transformed the way Kenyans travel and how goods are transported in this country. Now, the old rail system, the single uh, gauge railway, which was about 500 kilometers, was built over a century ago, but was very, very slow. It took about 15 hours just to travel a section of 500 kilometers and even then you were lucky if you got there without the train breaking down now with this new ultra modern system it takes about uh, five to seven hours to get to the coastal city of Mombasa and it has transformed the way people travel here we're talking about not just safety we're talking about comfort uh, and we're talking about changing the way people uh, view traveling in this country now, uh, the, the inland depot, which is about 120 kilometers from our current position on the opposite side of Mombasa in Naivasha, is where all the goods coming from the coastal or the port city of Mombasa are stored and then onwards to other countries and to other parts of the country as well. Now, apart from this uh, particular project, you also have the Addis Ababa to Djibouti rail standard gauge rail network which also transports people and also transports goods that has also transformed how things are done there but this is all part of this connectivity uh, project uh, within the belt and road initiative we also have highways we've got aviation hubs we have ports like the port of Lamu which was launched just over a month ago by Kenya's president Uhuru Kenyatta built by a Chinese company as well. Now, the, re the ties between China and Africa date back centuries, up to the Ming Dynasty, where the famous Admiral Zheng He uh, and his fleet came to the, co uh, to the East African coast and then go over to the 60s, where China supported Africa's liberation in various forms up to the point that by 1965 you had uh, at least 19 countries uh, 19 countries extending their relations with official relations with China and then on to the 70s where 
Africa supported uh, China's bid to get back into the United Nations. So it just shows you how strong those ties have been over the years. Now, a lot of people you speak to uh, will tell you, will talk about China's assistance uh, with Africa dating back over the last two decades, but it goes much farther than that. You have to go back to the 70s uh, where, China, where China built and financed the 1800 kilometer Tazara rail network connecting Tanzania and Zambia. So that is evident, but in uh, the later stages, in the last couple of years, we've had uh, China come step in, especially during this pandemic, uh, to assist Africa to show up its health systems. We've also had medical teams sent by China to help Africa within this pandemic. But more so in the last couple of months where we've seen this uh, donation of vaccines to Africa, whereas most Western developed countries have looked inwards, focusing more on their populations. China made a pledge very early on to assist Africa fight this pandemic and help stop the spread of this COVID-19. And we've seen that through uh, the donations of vaccines, which has been ongoing for the last few months and has covered uh, more than 20, 25 countries across the African continent. And it's uh, uh, during President Xi Jinping's tenure as president of China that we've seen China grow into a global uh, economic powerhouse and, and, and use its, uh, its, its, its economic wealth to help and assist other developing countries. Back to you. Thank you very much. Our correspondent Robert Nagila in Nairobi. And for more insight, we're joined in the studio by Professor Wang Xingsong from Beijing Normal University. So, Professor, seeking common ground while reserving differences. It's indeed a Chinese notion. But do you think it also echoes the very essence of multilateralism? And let's take China-Africa cooperation as an example, as we just heard. We know Africa as a continent has suffered from Western colonialism and uh, more uh, recently from the huge inequality caused by neoliberalism. How the cooperation between China and Africa is different from that? Well, um, as a foreign policy principle, seeking common ground while reserving differences is a, um, a long-held uh, foreign policy principle by China. It was first brought up by China in the 1950s, and Premier Zhou Enlai gave an elaboration on this principle during the Bandung Conference, and it helped China break the ice in its diplomatic relations with its Asian neighbors and African brothers when China was isolated by the West. And since then, it has uh, long been part of uh, Chinese foreign policy. Um, but uh, the meanings also vary across time. Uh, in the beginning, China called for um, uh, shelving differences in ideologies and uh, political systems. And in the 1990s, the Chinese leaders further encouraged all nations to uh, value diversity. So instead of uh, hailing clash of civilizations, mm. uh, China values the diversity of civilizations. And the recent calling for building a uh, community with shared future for mankind also echoes this principle. All in all, I think uh, the uh, principle of uh, 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 seeking common ground while reserving differences uh, is a very important principle. It also borrows from the ancient Chinese philosophy, uh, harmony with difference. So difference is a given, but differences should never preclude cooperation and harmony. Right, Professor. Earlier, we, we also heard quite a lot from the ping pong diplomacy, a prelude to the uh, former uh, foreign uh, diplomatic relations between uh, the People's Republic of China and the United States. And looking at the current status of bilateral ties between China and the US, do you think we can still get some wisdom out of um, that historical echo? Well, I do think uh, this principle needs to be uh, needs to have some continuities because in this world, the uh, one size fits all kind of mentality is still dominating. But look, you know, the uh, the human the problems human beings are facing are not going to have this one singular solution, and there is no single political system that, that that's compatible to all the societies in the world. So diversity is a good thing because. Diversity presents options, and if you look at the Chinese economic experience, you know we borrowed a lot from the international experience.
but we also inherit a lot from our own learning and planning. So in other words, uh, it is the diversity of options that provides the foundation for Chinese economic development. So that when China goes out and deals with international relations, you know, we also promote diversity. You know, we, uh, we take other countries interests and political systems as what they are and we find ways to work out the differences instead of lecturing others or even forcing upon others to adopt one's own model because history has proved that the efforts of homogenizing the world have all failed. Thank you very much. Professor Wang Xingzong from Beijing Normal University. And over the past century, the Communist Party of China has led the country from extreme poverty to becoming a well-off society. The reform and opening up introduced in the late 1970s has played a key role in boosting livelihood over the past few decades. Some experts in China have shared their perspectives on the tremendous changes that have taken place. So back in 2001, for instance, when China was uh, accepted into the World Trade Organization, Brazil-China trade was $1 billion a year. Today, Brazil-China trade is $1 billion every 72 hours. So it's, it's really uh, impressive what's, what's happened there. And I understand that the opening up, especially through trade, is one of the reasons why China has reason to become uh, the world's biggest economy. Colombia and China, we have 41 years of diplomatic relations. And we find in China a really key partner in this global world. The, the changes that, that China you know, uh, uh, undergo in the, in, the, in the last decades ha has been a lot, not, not only for China, for all the world, and especially for my country as well. China's ability to lift people out of poverty is well known, hundreds of millions of people since uh, the recent times. But if you look at the quality of life and the urbanization that is taking place, that has progressed in a very meaningful way for us. And of course, we've seen China move progressively from a manufacturing-oriented economy to an innovation-led economy. All of this is creating a very different dynamic for us here in China. Tomorrow in this special series, we'll share how the Communist Party of China fosters innovation. And we'll also take a look at how it pursues economic development in the country's rural areas. Do stay tuned for that. But that's it for this edition of Global Watch on CGTN. I'm Pandong in Beijing. Bye for now.